Thank you all for coming. This is the press conference uh, on the officer-involved shooting on September 4th, 2022 at 2900 East Wabash. And why we are doing this now is the independent investigation is complete. And when we release media records of body cam footage, surveillance video, things like that, we like to provide the opportunity for the media to come look so that we can provide context to what they're seeing. So, um, we will get going here. So the Spokane Independent Investigative Response Team, sometimes referred to as the SIR team, is comprised of three different agencies, the Sheriff's Department, Spokane Police Department, and the Washington State Patrol. When one of those agencies is involved in a use of deadly force, they are removed from the response team. So in this case, Spokane Police Department is not a part of the SIR team. The lead agency on this incident was the Sheriff's Office, Spokane County Sheriff's Office and the assistant agency was the Washington State Patrol. So once the independent investigation is complete, then it goes to the prosecutor's office. And then that starts our internal review process, which is standard procedure, where the Spokane Police Department does an administrative review, and internal affairs gets the entire case file, and we begin our public records request processing. So in this case, on March 15th, the prosecutor's office determined there were no criminal charges in the shooting against the two officers, which were identified as Corporal Chris Johnson and Detective Trevor Walker. So the prosecutor's office takes all the facts into consideration of the independent investigation and they determined that the use of de deadly force was justified. So we're going to go into events leading up to this officer contact. So on August 30th, there was a neighborhood dispute between Scott Scott and Robert Bradley, who uh, were next door neighbors. There was an allegation that Bradley threatened Scott and his juvenile son with a firearm and at that time it was reported that the firearm was on Bradley's right hip in a holster. The next day, August 31st, August 31st, Scott Scott actually petitioned the courts for a protection order and on September 2nd the order a temporary protection order along with an order to surrender firearms was signed and issued by Judge Maurer that protected Scott and his juvenile son from Bradley. So this order had not yet been served and needed to be served. The background for police contact, so September 4th Scott calls the police department and asks for assistance in the service of this order. And when he didn't get a response um, after a while, he called back to radio and our patrol sergeant, Sergeant Steve Perry, was working and he ends up calling Bradley back and giving him his cell phone number so that when Bradley returns home, he could be contacted by police. So that same night at 9.56 p.m., Scott texts Sergeant Perry to advise Robert Bradley is home again, and then also advises that he is armed with a AR-15 rifle. Scott also reports then a little bit later that Bradley puts the rifle in his van and his van is parked in the alley behind the home, in the alley, and that Bradley went inside his home. So when officers arrive on scene, 
Sergeant Perry recognizes that there is an increased need for officer presence due to the fact that Bradley could potentially be armed. But also, if you remember, not just the protection order, but it's also an order to surrender firearms. And typically, when we have an order to surrender firearms, we must think that that, that subject is armed. So, uh, and not knowing how many firearms that they have access to. So Sergeant Perry is requesting additional officers to assist in serving Bradley with the warrant. And, uh, I'm sorry, not with the warrant. To assist in serving Bradley with the protection order and the order to surrender firearms. So the three named officers there, Corporal Johnson, Detective Walker, and Officer Lemming, are the three officers that go to the alley behind the home where the van is supposed to be parked. In addition to this coordination, Sergeant Perry recognizes the need to have people on the front of the house as well. So Sergeant Perry's in the front of the house with other officers and he tries to call Bradley over the phone to try and get him to come out to serve him the order. So when he calls, there was no answer on the phone. So the three officers that were in the back, in the alley, they are monitoring the van that's in the alley behind the home and they see then Bradley by the passenger side of the van. So now we're going into the actual contact with Robert Bradley. The passenger door is open and officers see Bradley standing inside the open door and the torso area of him is, is looking around inside the passenger area of the van. Officers walk up to the van to make contact with Bradley to serve him the order for protection and the order to surrender firearms. I will add that the officers do have uh, the initial officer uh, in the front of the three that you will see walking up to Bradley. The first one has a, a rifle with him, an AR-15, and we issue AR-15 to patrol officers for precision um, and for um, accuracy. It's a, it's a more accurate tool than just a handgun. And then the two officers behind Corporal Johnson have handguns out just at the low ready position, which means they're basically, it's accessible to them in their hands, but it's down and it's not pointing at anybody. And it's a precaution when we approach anybody that is potentially armed to do that so that our reaction time is quicker if we are presented with a deadly threat. So the officers walk to the van to make contact to serve the order for protection and the order to surrender firearms. So as officers approach Bradley, Corporal Johnson announces in a very clear and direct manner, Spokane Police, let me see both your hands. Next, I'm going to show you a screenshot. The screenshot is from Corporal Johnson's body camera video to where it shows at the, the, the viewpoint of the officers as they approach Bradley. So you will see, I'm going to use my, my red cursor here to point out things. Um, this is Bradley where he, his torso and his, his head is inside the vehicle, but he is standing outside of the vehicle. This shadow here is Corporal Johnson, and you can see the, the tip of his AR that's aimed down at the ground, his, his AR-15 rifle, and so it's, it's in the low ready position. Um, what you see up, up top here is, is Corporal Johnson's actual arm because it's above the, his body camera. But what's notable here is uh, there is there is light that is lighting the officers up as they walk down the alley. Uh, they have a viewpoint of 
Robert Bradley inside and they can see his head at least right here and um, Bradley can see out and presumably has a viewpoint of three officers as well as a fully marked patrol car that is parked in the alley. So I'm going to then go into Robert Bradley's response to police contact. And this is from the independent investigation. It shows the lead officer, Corporal Johnson, passed by the front of Robert's van. Robert rapidly stepped back from the passenger seat area. Robert then turns to face squarely at Corporal Johnson, who is standing by the right front corner of the van, which is where we saw that screenshot. On the opposite side of the van's open passenger door. So if you can picture, Mr. Bradley's on one side of the open door, Corporal Johnson's on the other side of the open door. As Robert turned his body toward Corporal Johnson, he simultaneously reached toward his right hip with his right hand, dropped his center of gravity, and then pushed his right hand and arm forward toward Corporal Johnson, who was now standing just a couple yards in front of Robert on the opposite side of the van's passenger door. Robert's movements were consistent with someone, someone taking a slightly crouched shooting stance and presenting and or aiming a pistol. This next screenshot is coming from a surveillance camera that was mounted on the back of Bradley's home and facing towards the alley where this incident occurred. So what you are seeing here, Corporal Johnson's in the front of the van already, so he is out of view. This second officer is Detective Walker, and this is Officer Lemming. And this is Robert Bradley standing in the doorway, and the response, this, there's his head, this is his right arm out and downward he is reaching toward his right hip and like I said before uh, his right hip where the previous incident happened with the neighbor was typically where he wore his gun in his holster and this next picture is a picture after the incident, where there is an empty holster on the right hip area of Bradley's jeans. This next screenshot depicts the stance that the investigation revealed, where it is a crouched slightly crouched stance with legs bent. His right arm is up and out forward, which me as a law enforcement officer is a shooting stance. You see now two of the officers are out of view and this is still Officer Lemming. So when presented with uh, what the officers saw, Corporal Johnson and Detective Walker respond to the deadly threat by firing their weapons at Bradley, striking Bradley and his handgun at that point in time. Corporal Johnson fired three rifle rounds and Detective Walker fired two handgun rounds. Bradley dropped his handgun fell to the ground, and under the driver's side of the truck that was parked next to the van. 
and I'll show you another screenshot here so you can now look at the position where he landed. So what you are seeing is Bradley had fallen, here's the truck I was referencing, and there is Bradley's head and his back, so his feet are out this way, and he is on his stomach. Additional shots fired. Bradley began crawling toward the handgun that had fallen, that was under the passenger side of his van. The lead detective summary noted, Bradley was moving toward his van and his pistol, now lying under his van. And Corporal Johnson then fired another quick volley of rounds toward Robert Bradley. Four additional rifle rounds were fired by Corporal Johnson, along with commands get away, stop reaching, do not reach. I'm going to show you a screenshot of where Bradley was moving to. Now if you can remember where he was, there is his head now. His right arm is out and he had moved from here toward the gun that had dropped just under the van over here. And I'll show you those pictures too. So to put it in perspective, I'm going to toggle back to the original location where he landed and where he moved to. That's where he was originally. And that's where he was moving to. Next, I'm going to show you a screenshot of Corporal Johnson's body camera, after those rounds were fired, when they started go getting compliance from Bradley, and they had shut the door to move closer to Bradley, and this screenshot from the body camera is going to show you a couple of items. So there's the van, the door is shut. Down here, this is some sort of a, a bag. Um, like a, a vinyl little bag, um, not really part of what I wanted you to see, but it comes into play. But here is the, the back end of the gun that Robert Bradley was reaching for. So that's, that's how close he was to it. Now I'm going to take you to some crime scene photos that actually put it into perspective as well and actually show the gun in more detail. So you see markers 12 and 13. 12 is that bag uh, that I had referenced. 13 is the gun that's under the passenger side of the van. And there's 13 closer. So there is the, the gun that was in the direction where Bradley was trying to reach. So, like our officers are always trained, after we inflict any sort of force, we try to render medical aid as soon as possible. We have to get secured scene first, so Bradley, after he began to comply with the officer's commands, Officers did approach. They shut the, the door so that they could get close. They handcuffed Bradley. 27 seconds after the last shot was fired. They then requested medics seven seconds after they started the handcuffing process. And once safely in custody, officers then began their first aid life-saving measures, assisted by fire and AMR upon their arrival. And impressively so, medics arrived two minutes and 30 seconds after being called. So they got there very, very quickly. Officers were able to uh, move Bradley out between the vehicles into the alleyway in order to perform uh, more freely their, their life-saving and first aid measures. 
Robert Bradley was transported by ambulance to Sacred Heart Medical Center where he succumbed to his wounds at 11.42 p.m. And that was about an, over an hour after he was transported from the scene. So we are going to get into the body camera footage, um, but I wanted to explain some things that you're going to see. Uh, so this body camera footage is redacted. So that means that there are some black boxes that you will see. And at one point in this first video, the whole screen goes black, but you still have the audio. And what's important in the audio is to listen to what the officers are saying. Um, they are checking for where the bullets went to make sure there's no other victims or, or damage from the bullets. They are also talking about the medical aid piece. So that's an important piece I wanted you to be able to hear. But the important thing about body cameras is it is a two-dimensional viewpoint. It does not work like our human eyes work, where we can look around, because the body camera is just focused solely on where that body camera is aimed, which is why officers can see things sometimes that the body camera doesn't, and take into consideration that the distance can be distorted, um, and a, a variety of things can be distorted with a two-dimensional view versus our human eye. Um, let me think, make sure I got all that before I start. Um, just remember that this incident happened very, very quickly, within seconds. So everything I showed you in the screenshots is going to happen very rapidly. That's why I wanted to make sure you had context of what you were actually looking at. So we'll get to start um, with Corporal Johnson's body camera video. And again, when the screen goes black, remember, just uh, listen to what is being said. very quick. I'm going to show you the next body camera video and that is Detective Walker's. as well because you couldn't necessarily hear as clearly Corporal Johnson's commands on Detective Walker's body camera. But when you hear the first body camera, you hear it very clearly. So that's another distortion too of, of 
relying on body camera footage. Okay, this third one is uh, even shorter. It's, it's uh, Officer Lemming's body camera. Okay, the next one is going to be the surveillance video just playing out. Um, again, just a reminder, this happens very, very quickly, and a reminder of the different things you're going to see in this surveillance video where um, you have uh, the officers coming up in front contacting and making verbal commands to Robert Bradley, his response of reaching for his right hip where he was known to ban. So this video actually has no audio, so you will just see the visual. Now you're going to see other officers respond to assist with the medical aid in securing the scene. Okay, so we are going to get now into Robert Bradley's handgun. So if you can see the end of his gun has damage right here. And the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab indicated that that damage was consistent with a bullet strike. And they tested that area and it was chem chemically processed for the presence of gunshot residue, tested positive for the presence of copper and lead. And that's going to become important here in a second. If you can see the picture on the upper right, the gun is out of battery. So that means that the barrel of the gun is set back and that firearm now, because of this damage, could not be fired back. So the WSP Crime Lab report, that is a firearm specialist, Murphy, offered that the cartridge found, which was damaged, inside Bradley's 10 millimeter pistol chamber. So that is essentially saying that the chamber, the chambered bullet in Robert Bradley's gun was damaged and that, that bullet was made of monolithic copper. Thus it had no lead in the bullet or the cartridge. And this fact was significant because the firearm specialist's examination revealed a strong positive test for the presence of lead on the damaged bullet and Corporal Johnson was using copper jacketed lead rounds. So 
what that is saying is these findings further confirm that one of the involved officers, Corporal Johnson, fired up the barrel of Bradley's pistol. I'm going to take you to another view of the gun. So this is the bullet that was chambered in Robert Bradley's handgun that was damaged by Corporal Johnson's bullet. And the bullet was damaged with the projectile going up the barrel into that casing and bullet, pushing it back into the casing and expanding it so much so that the casing couldn't be readily ejected from the, the gun. It had to be pried out of there because it had expanded so much. And that lower right picture, you can see the top where you would normally see the top of the bullet. You can see where the projectile from Corporal Johnson's bullet impacted into Robert Bradley's bullet. So simply speaking, physics, a gun has to be pointed at another gun for that to occur. It is simple physics. And with that, I am done with my presentation and would welcome any questions that anybody has. I'll start. Okay. Um, do you have the number of officers that were on scene when shots were fired, whether that's in front or back? Because we saw a number kind of come up behind you, the total number. Yeah, I don't have a number. That's a great question. Um, I'm sure the investigation shows that. Okay. And it's, I will tell you that the three officer body camera footage that you saw here are the only three that actually capture the use of force. Okay. Um, and then I know there were obviously other officers who were in front um, with the paperwork kind of ready to come up and knock on the door. Um, could you maybe talk about like why the decision was made to come around back so quickly versus doing an initial door knock at the front of the house? So officers, when they first arrived, they contained the residents in the front and the back. And the Sergeant, Sergeant Perry was trying to reach Bradley by phone to get him to actually come out of the house. So we're at more of an advantage for any sort of firearms issue. And when he couldn't reach the, um, Bradley by phone, um, officers actually saw Bradley back at the van. So that was why they made contact back there. So, but the other officers in the front, because I've seen their body camera footage as well, um, were like prepping to walk up the front door. So was there like communication, like we see him in the back, should we go up? Like was that something that was communicated or discussed? It was, yeah, there is, it's, and it will be on radio traffic okay. that is in that um, release as okay. well. Uh, you know, I think one of the questions that many people have been asking is, you know, this happened back in 2022. It kind of seemed to take a while for this information to get out there. You know, why did this take so long, I guess? Like, what is the process and, and why this was so elongated? Well, we aren't part of the independent investigation. So um, what I do know is when that investigation is complete, we start our public records request um, processing. So. When it went to the prosecutor's office, um, and I'm trying to remember the date. I don't have it. It's probably, do you early remember? March. Early March. So that's when it went to the prosecutor's office. The prosecutor actually ruled fairly quickly on it. And then um, basically when we get done with our public records, that's when we do these press conferences to provide context to the video. So it, our, our end actually, I feel like went very quickly, but I wouldn't be able to speak to why the independent investigation took the time that it did. Where are we at in the internal investigation? Thank you. Um, that is part of our administrative review. Uh, so when it went to the prosecutor's office, the case file goes directly to our internal affairs for our administrative review of the incident. So I don't know where it is at now, but as soon as it went to the prosecutor's office, it also went to our internal affairs. But it's not completed. Correct. Okay. 
there have been multiple officer involved shootings this year uh, in this situation where deadly force was justified what did the department learn and how could that be applied to you know the sort of shootings that we saw at the beginning of this year that's a good question part of the administrative process in the review will likely uh, cover that piece I can't speak to it because it's still being reviewed but there are at times there are outcomes that come from different different incidents I guess just to clarify obviously deadly force was required in this situation so what lessons could we could the department pull in reacting appropriately and how were they applied not to the shootings that happened this year but just in general moving forward so when there is a investigation administrative review we have our internal affairs review and we also have a deadly force review board so that deadly force review board has not been conducted yet once that review board is uh, conducted on this incident and any incident we do it on every single deadly force uh, use of deadly force those reviews have the outcomes that that you're talking about if there are any can you um, clarify why the decision was made to redact the officer's moment of contact in those videos um, with the suspect Im immediately after the shooting? Yes, so a lot of it is to protect the family. Um, we don't need to put the family through any, any more trauma. So we, um, and the public um, as well, it's, it's, um, it's a loss of life and that's, that's not something that we readily want the public to see. And so the court order that the officers initially came with, that was after the neighbor made the call that he was back with the firearm. Um, so the officers w were trying to initially make contact to in enforce that order. Um, not to enforce it, but to serve it. Yeah, so uh, officers are, are there to, to serve paperwork and, um, and get any firearms that need to be surrendered. So when officers responded, uh, the intent was just to serve serve the paperwork. So, related to that, how do um, officers, when they're going to serve paperwork like this, this is civil paperwork, um, my understanding is it was, you know, like a temporary initial phase of this restraining order. How do they weigh um, reports from the neighbor who, you know, are subjective reports um, against you know, the level of preparation they need, like how do you weigh those reports? Because obviously you have, you know, there haven't been investigation done to see if those are true or not, what the neighbor's saying. So what we have to rely on is the judge that looks at the facts mm -hmm. that, that the judge has presented in the petition for the order. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that take that in, into consideration mm -hmm. and determine whether an order is going to be um, in, uh, issued. issued. Thank yeah. you. Yes, so what we are doing then is uh, enforcing or presenting the, the respondent of the order with the judge's signed order. So we aren't really the ones that take it into consideration where things are valid or not, and the court is the one that actually does that, and the temporary order issues a court date for that. But in this instance, there had been direct contact with Scott Scott and he had made additional allegations that are you know not a part of that order or not what the judge considered saying he had an AR-15 he was walking around the yard so you know how do you consider those um, you know the validity of those yes and so we actually we have to consider that mm -hmm. as um, until we can prove otherwise mm -hmm. that there are no firearms present mm -hmm. we have to assume that there are if we're being told that there are but it's not illegal for him to have those firearms. Correct. Okay. I did have a point of clarification on that. When that call came in saying he had an AR-15 style, was one ever found at the scene or recovered or anything like that? Yes. From the, okay. Just yes. To there were three firearms, I believe, that were okay. um, recovered in the proximity of Mr. Bradley. And uh, the order was also to surrender firearms as well. So, again, we... We have to, I, I don't like using the word assume, but typically when we find that there's an order to surrender firearms, we do fire, find firearms. Um, was WSP able to determine, um, obviously there's kind of a lot going on there with a 
bullet fired into Mr. Bradley's gun, but were they able to determine if he fired the weapon uh, at all? No. Okay. He did not fire his weapon. He did not fire his weapon. Correct. When the three officers initially approached Bradley, did, did all of them see him in that cross, crouch position? Um, or did an officer fire his weapon first, and that kind of all escalated into everyone else firing? Or did the other officer fire? Uh, the, the two officers that fired their weapons saw the, the position and, and the reaction of Mr. Bradley. Could you tell us again where that surveillance camera was mounted? I believe it was mounted on the back of Mr. Bradley's residence. Okay. Anything else? Um, could you maybe just talk about the um, rapidity of this situation? Um, it seems, I mean, looking at the count there, it's five seconds from, you know, arriving to shots fired. How do officers, um, are, are you trained to slow things down or to, to handle situations like that? Officers are, um, we typically have to react to what we're presented with. Mm -hmm. but. Along with that, officers have to take everything that they're seeing and witnessing into consideration on everything they do. So because this happened so fast, it was a lot of information that officers processed in order to make this decision. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.